I was lucky enough to live in a place once where there were purple emperors and when I got home from a very sweaty walk I'd leave my boots outside and on a number of occasions they would come down and sip the sweat out of my sweaty boots. I first got interested in butterflies and moths way back when I was a very young child in my garden and I picked up a caterpillar and my mother put it into a ventilated jam jar with the correct food plant and it pupated, turned into a chrysalis, she told me, and then we watched it emerge on our dining room table and a miracle happened in front of me. Not so much a miracle as metamorphosis, of course, but it was so special. I mean, I, I nearly burst with excitement. And ever since then, I've always had a tremendous fondness for these insects. If I had to pick a favorite, difficult, but male brimstone, first thing in spring. Mmm, the proper b -b -b butterfly. Finding some caterpillars can be incredibly tricky because they don't want to be found. They are remarkably camouflaged. Now, if they can hide from birds, they can hide from you. So I would go for the very obvious and easy to find common caterpillars. Nettle patches. I know they're a bit stingy, but they're home to peacock caterpillars, small tortoiseshell caterpillars, if you're lucky, red admiral caterpillars. And they make little webs there so you can see which nettle that they're on. So get your long trousers on, get your long sleeves on, and have a look around a nettle bed to find those very, very exciting caterpillars. <laughs> To get more butterflies and moths into our gardens, we need to, well, never have plastic grass. Um, maybe if you've got a lawn, allow a little bit of your lawn to go a bit wild. And if you're even more adventurous, just get rid of the lawn altogether because just one species of grass is pretty boring, especially boring if you're a butterfly and a moth. So you want two things there. You want lots of flowers producing nectar throughout the whole of the spring and summer season. That's a range of different species. And then, of course, you need the food plant of those butterflies and moths, which means you need quite a lot of grasses. Quite a lot of those species like feeding on grasses. But then you need to be tolerant of other things you may not like. Ivy, very important for holly blues and swallowtail moths. If you don't have ivy, you can't have those species. So it's about building a mosaic of different plants which will attract these insects. And remember, if you build it, they will come. Butterfly eggs are not always easy to find. Some butterflies want to hide them, so they're very well camouflaged. Others are actually quite brightly coloured. They can be bright white or sometimes sort of a luminous yellow. Um, if you're lucky enough to find them, you're really going to need a hand lens or a magnifying glass to see the structure. And when you look at them in close up, they are exquisitely beautiful. So they're sculptured. Um, in order to, I guess, protect them from predators and also to give these shells structure. Very often when they hatch, the first thing the emerging larvae does is eat that egg shell that's protected it for normally in the region of sort of 10 to 12 to 14 days, or some eggs, of course, over winter, so it varies from species to species. Some species of butterfly lay their eggs in clumps. Those are easier to find than those that lay them singularly. So if you were to say to me, go on then, go and find some butterfly eggs, I'd head straight to the nettle patch because there you find that a single small tortoise shell or peacock butterfly will lay a lot of eggs on one nettle plant. So once you've found one, you've hit the jackpot. Purple emperors are a truly spectacular butterfly, but I'm sad to say that you are unlikely to encounter them on your big butterfly count. So you'll have to travel especially to see them. Now there are a number of reserves around the country where you can go and look for these insects without damaging them or the reserve. What they like are two key things. Very big oak trees that they can fly around and do their display and then sallow beneath that, another tree species, and they need that one of course because their caterpillars feed on it. But there are many places that you could find online where there is this combination and you need to go at the right time of year and I've got to say you really do need a sunny day in order to see them and some patience because sometimes they're so high up flying around the trees you don't get a very good view. In days of old to get a closer look at these things entomologists used 
a variety of means of trying to lure them down to the ground because purple emperor butterflies like sipping salts from liquids. So I was lucky enough to live in a place once where there were purple emperors and when I got home from a very sweaty walk I'd leave my boots outside and on a number of occasions they would come down and sip the sweat out of my sweaty boots. Other things people have tried are cans of sardines, rotten crushed fruit and I'm very sad to say dog poo and dog poo works. They love coming down and sitting on excrement getting those nutrients that they need to sustain their metabolism. So if you are in purple emperor full hunting mode you'll need to come equipped with something quite smelly to lure them down out of the treetops. I think the best way to encourage young people to get into butterflies and moths is to allow them to get close to them. So if you're lucky enough to find a caterpillar, put it on the palm of their hand gently, hold their hand so it can't be damaged, crushed or dropped, and just let them feel the tickle of its little legs. I remember that. I remember the tickle of those legs climbing up my fingers. I remember looking at those lackey moth caterpillars as they were, like this, and being totally entranced. And then when it comes to the adult insects, again, teach them how to stalk up to them quietly. Get them down on their hands and knees in the grass, sneaking up on those butterflies. And if you're lucky enough to have a pair of close focusing binoculars, then don't hog them yourself. Give them to those young people to use. Now, if you're lucky enough to spot a very rare butterfly whilst you're doing your big butterfly count, and it's not one of those on the sheet or the app, we'd still like to hear about it, of course. So you can go to butterfly-conservation.org and log your result there, because it might get some of us very, very excited. If you're unfortunate enough to do your big butterfly count and you don't see any butterflies and moths, that is still incredibly important to us. Negative data, knowing where there aren't things, is just as important as knowing where there are things. So although it may be dissatisfying, we would really, really like to tell us if you don't see any butterflies or if you just see one or two. Don't be embarrassed. We need that data. <laughs>